We're back, folks. Thank you very much for joining us wherever you are in the world. We've had such a wonderful response to these interviews, broadcasts, conversations. It's just been fabulous to see the engagement from so many of you. And we're so grateful for that. So grateful because this stuff really matters. Um, and er, as you've gathered by now, everybody that we, uh, we introduce you to has got such an important message. Uh, and as we've said from the start, the, the, the overall aim of these Siri, this series, these broadcasts, is to is to keep all of us together uh, in in the animal welfare, animal conservation, animal loving community, and keep us empowered and inspired and proactive in in taking steps, taking action, and making the world a better place for animals, which I personally believe makes the world a better place for everybody and everything, as well, because compassion isn't species specific. You know, it's not choosy. You're either compassionate or you're not. And if we can if we can engender and inspire compassion in people, who and what doesn't win? I think it's, uh, it's fairly obvious. And tonight, my guest is the living embodiment of that. And um, before I introduce him, it's an interesting, I find it really interesting um, living in the world that we do. Uh, especially, I know that so many of you guys who are, who are joining me on these, these uh, broadcasts, feel very much like I do in the sense that you know you're you you feel all the empathy and the compassion that we're talking about and you wish like I do that the world would go vegan overnight you wish that everyone would drive an electric car tomorrow or just ride a bike and stop polluting and wish that people would stop hurting the world and the animals that we share it with and I guess the the challenge for some of us well all of us uh, who, who have the compassion and empathy that I'm talking about is, is accepting the world that we live in and the reality of that world. It's not going to happen overnight. It's just not. And just like a car manufacturer should be held accountable for the emissions of the vehicles they're allowed to, to keep producing while we evolve, while we evolve to the point where we one day hopefully will be driving all fully sustainable electric vehicles or whatever comes after electric and is even less impactful on the environment than electricity and everything that we're doing along the way has to be monitored has to be regulated otherwise it will be a free-for-all and things will be a lot worse and when we're talking about if that's relevant with cars when we're talking about living sentient intelligent beings while we accept that reality along the way that people are not going to stop eating meat overnight, even if we're seeing an evolution towards it in some people. But I'm going to I'm going to be talking to someone tonight who I think can give us some really really deep insight into into the realities there as well. But while we're moving towards that, however long it takes, we have got to hold the people who are providing for that demand, which still exists, accountable. We've got to hold them accountable. They've got to be responsible for what they're doing and how they're doing it. And with that, it's such an honor to be able to introduce you to Mr. Philip Limbury, who is the CEO of Compassion in World Farming. Philip, thank you so much for being here. Dan, it's such a pleasure. Thank you hugely for having me here. Great to see you. The last Great time we, we last time we, we saw each other, you, you were here. In uh, my house, you are filming for your brilliant forthcoming documentary, Food for Thought. Very much looking forward to that. Food for Thought. That's the one. Thank you very much for your kind words. It was such an honor to have you in the film. So as Philip says, he, he did very kindly agree to speak uh, in Food for Thought, the documentary that Giles and I are making. And, um, and so knowledgeably and authoritatively and compassionately, um, you know, it was just invaluable to us. And, and of course, you guys will get to see that. And you're going to take, you know, you in the next hour, you're going to get a little sneak peek, a little taster of the kind of insights that Philip shared with us. And um, I do want to just go slightly off off subject just for a second to let you know, although touch wood and fingers crossed, nothing's amiss at the moment. When Philip and I were first speaking just 15 minutes ago, our internet was being a complete and utter little 
twerp. And uh, we don't know why. Uh, it might just be the fact that we live in a world where there's twice as much internet traffic on a regular day as there used to be. Um, however, fingers crossed, and everyone send your positive um, broadband <laughs> plunging energy our way, please, and we'll hope that this will stay. However, if, if, you, uh, if you notice that there's a delay, that's because Philip and I have noticed there's a delay, and we will uh, therefore allow a pause between each other speaking, which might just seem like we're on an old school international phone call. It's, um, it's just the interwebs playing up. So, but anyway, back to, back to the subject at hand, um, Philip, I mean, it's, it, as per my, my introduction that I wrote about you a few days ago when I, when I uh, said that I was going to be having you as a guest on, on the series, your CV, your bio makes for some incredible reading. You have been involved in this compassionate movement for decades. Tell, tell me how you got into this in the first place. Well, Dan, I, I was, uh, I've been a, a wildlife enthusiast since I was a small boy, and that really was my passion. You know, looking for birds, looking for mammals, uh, you know, looking for fish in the ponds, those kind of things. Just an absolute fascination. And then, as I got older, uh, someone put uh, a leaflet into my hand, which taught me about how animals are treated on farms and in uh, in vivisection laboratories. And I went vegetarian vegetarian uh you know almost overnight and uh this was back in the 80s and then i went vegan uh, and then in 1990 i met this extraordinary person um he was an ex-farmer uh, called peter roberts and you know what i uh, i showed up his, at his place uh, he was running an organization that i'd heard of because i've been giving out leaflets an organization called compassion in world farming and you know i I, I was, uh, you know, a, a passionate vegan then, as I am now. Uh, and I said to Peter, you know, uh, you've, factory farming, what's, uh, you know, what's happening with factory farming and meat consumption? And he said, look, you know, there, there, there are uh, billions of animals reared and slaughtered for meat every single year. And the reality is that it's going up every year. It's still going up every year. So we've got to do something whilst we argue strongly for drastic reductions in meat and dairy consumption, we've also got to layer in the need to end this cruelty, to end the, the keeping of animals in cages where, where they can't even turn around for weeks or months at a time, where they can't stretch their wings. And you know what? I was hooked. That was 30 years ago. Uh, I said, please give me a job. Um, he rang up a couple of days later and he said, look, I'm sorry, uh, you didn't get the job. And I was devastated. But he said uh, the reason why was because you didn't have the skills and experience that we were looking for. But we noticed a passion in you. So we found another job for you. We want to give you a job as uh, as an assistant, uh, my assistant. Uh, so to Peter Roberts. Uh, so do you want it? And I nearly took his hand off uh, you know, as I climbed down the phone at him. And, you know, 30 years on, I'm still here plugging away. And Compassionate World Farming you know, continues to grow as a, as a movement. We are a movement of of, uh, of individuals across across the world who want a better day for animals. That's what it's about. And I mean, it's 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 inex it's inescapable. I mean, it, it it's just as I said at the beginning, it's a reality. As much as we wish it wasn't, and I know that Philip doesn't mind me doing this because we spoke about it earlier. We have a visitor. Are we lost in the delay? There we go. A little moment of Kiki to, to to entertain us during the delay. Yeah, the delay has kicked in, as you guys will have seen. Um, but um, we'll get through so, it. We'll get through it. Dan, uh, so that, that was a, a little opener. But um, the, the, the fact is, Dan, that there are more animals factory farmed in the world today than uh, than there ever were. That's the sad fact. But uh, you know, we are making progress. We've uh, achieved bans on some of the worst systems and practices uh, in the in, in the European Union, in the UK, for example, getting bans on barren battery cages. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Philip, you said I don't. I hope the delay won't mess up our conversation too much. But just if you catch this, you you mentioned something in your first opening uh, words there, which is quite staggering because we all know that the vegan 
or plant-based movement is growing rapidly. But, but it sounds also, as you just said, like Kiki. meeting. Beautiful. Oh, that's how much the delay is. Okay. Wow, that's a hell of a delay. We got a we got about a minute long delay. This might be an interesting evening, folks. Um, but the um, the fact that Philip just said that the numbers exactly. of meetings yeah. are growing is terrifying. Hats off to you, Dan. I've been enjoying the Kiki moments on uh, on Instagram. Absolutely wonderful to see you know, a, a wild squirrel with you in your home, you know, touching you and and feeding from your table. Absolutely amazing. Kiki's an amazing little lockdown buddy to have. Uh, now, we, we're going to have an interesting one here, folks, because Philip, as you can see, Philip's catching what I say about 30 seconds or a minute after I say it, which could be very interesting. Um, in the Limbury household, if you have any other internet uh, devices switched on, please uh, take them off the Wi-Fi. That might help for a start, but um, we'll see how we go. Yeah. Failing that, what we'll do it is... We'll it is terrifying, Dan, you know, the... The, the trouble is that we've got uh... <laughs> oh gosh this is going to be a challenge let's see how we go okay so what i'm going to do what i'm going to do and we'll see if it helps the internet sort itself out i'm going to play the film called dear humans um and we'll see what uh, what you guys make of that and if it allows me to play that we'll know that the um the internet isn't struggling too much so let's see if we can get this up for you because i think you'll find it amazing now i believe uh, this is an award-winning film uh, created by Compassion and World Farming. It just won a ho whole host of awards uh, just recently, and uh, right and rightly so. So I'm going to play this for you, and uh, you can enjoy this while we hope that our internet traffic sorts itself out. So here comes. Dear humans. Dear fellow humans. We'd like to share a message from our animal friends. As you may or may not know, we hate cages. They really love the outdoors, running, ruffling, pecking. You see, me too. I love the outdoors too. They love it just as much as we humans do. I like snuggling. We love being with their mums. We do. We like a paddle. They love a dip, just like us. They just like to be free. They just want space to hang out with their friends. Okay, that's enough. The point is, we all love watching cute animal videos. But have you ever noticed? They're never in cages. Whichever animal you love. They could really do with your help. Because life in a cage is no life at all. Cages are cruel, outdated, and just plain wrong. Let's end the cage age. So this is how it works. We'll show you more cute animal videos, but only when you followed the link and signed the petition. Until then, I'll just be here. Thank you. So there we go, folks. I hope you enjoyed that. And um, it's, I have to say, as, as brilliant as I think that film is, I, hard, I find it hard to see how Joanna Lumley staying on screen is any kind of an incentive to do something to stop her being on screen. <laughs> because why would you want her off the screen? But um, let's see if we've got any, um, any better luck with the internet at the moment. I can see from Philip's reaction that we probably haven't. Um, how how long is it going to take for you to hear this, Philip? Or are you still watching the film? Gosh, that's a worry, if you are. We're going to have to figure out a way of having a conversation with a one-minute gap. In fact, I'll tell you what we're going to do, Mr. Limbury, if you'd be so kind, because it seemed to help last time. If you drop off and, dro and, and rejoin, that might just um, unclog things a little bit. So when you hear this message, jump off, jump back on, and I will wing it until you rejoin us and i apologize folks for the fact that you um you're seeing a strange and clunky internet experience this evening but that is the world of technology especially in the present day um i'm getting the sense that philip is still watching the film so this could be quite a long one um what i'm going to do in the meantime is i'm going to talk uh, a little bit about 
um, some of the things that I started talking about before I introduced Philip, but also I want you guys to feel free to ask any questions you've got. Because one thing we never get the chance to do, at least not very much, is to interact with you as much as we'd like to. So if you've got any questions specifically for myself or even Giles, who's my co-director on the Food for Thought documentary, feel free to ask a question. Or of course, if you've got any questions, more importantly for uh, Philip Limbury, CEO of Compassion in Wealth Farming, ping them over in the comments and we'll see how uh, see how we get on with him rejoining us. And uh, th th at this point, it doesn't look like it's going terribly well. Oh, we got a thumbs up. Gosh, so the delay is now down to about um, three and a half minutes. So we're doing really well. That's as bad an internet connection as I've ever seen. But let's hope that we uh, we get him back. If you're um, if you're having a good experience this evening, then you're a series fanatic, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, okay, so according to Linda, we have we only have a minute or two delay. And in in, the, in Germany there, I think you're Germany, aren't you, Linda? You had a blackout. So strange things are happening in the world at, at the moment. Uh, you know, there's some really, really interesting, uh, strange web outages, blackouts, goodness knows what. It seems to me, from the comments that I'm seeing, possibly, is that the, the, um, the delay is enormous and you're only just seeing the film. But I'm going to add Philip back in. How are you doing, monsieur? Nice to see you again. Uh, great to see you, Dan. How you doing? We don't seem to have any delay now, which is nice. Great, great. See, we're back in business. We're a couple of techies. Excellent. So you've got some really important <laughs> stuff that you want to talk we've about. Right? It. Yeah, we see. We seem to be sorted. It seems like it bottlenecks a little bit, and then it, so we'll we'll try and I want. Why don't you tell me, without any delay, what are some of the most important things to you in terms of your work with Compassion and World Farming and what you want people to know, to understand, to get involved with. I'd love for you to be able to share that message despite the internet difficulties we're having this evening. Dan, well, thank you. Uh, Compassion and World Farming is, is all about the animals. Our mission is to end factory farming, end the caging, cramming and confining of, of animals uh, in an inhumane food system. We want to see a drastic reduction of meat and dairy. We want to see take animals taken out of the system. Uh, and we, we've been campaigning hard uh, for more than 50 years. We've, we've, we've achieved many things, bans on cruel veal crates, on keeping uh, hens in, in the most barren of battery cages, getting animals recognized as sentient beings capable of feeling pain and suffering in Europe. But there's still so much to do, and that's why we're working now in Britain, across Europe, in China, America, South Africa, on a global campaign to end factory farming for all our sakes. The reality is that uh, about 75 billion land animals and countless fish are caught up in this awful, awful system. But the great news is that we can all take action three times a day. We can all take action on our on our plate uh, by choosing to to eat plants um, rather than meat and dairy. Uh, for those that do have meat and dairy, choosing pasture fed, free range, or organic. Uh, you know the, the the fact is that meat eating is on the rise. Uh, so our message, our the urgency of saving animals from suffering and getting them out of this dreadful system. It couldn't be more urgent, couldn't be more necessary and more timely. Yeah. And I mean, can you explain a little bit about that dynamic, which I think is probably going to come as quite a shock to a lot of people that, that even though we're seeing this enormous surge in uptake of the plant-based lifestyle, that there's also uh, an up, upsurge in meat eating. How does, how is that happening? Where are you seeing that? certain areas of the world. And while video catches up, a little bit more kiki for you. <laughs> so I think the delay is, um, is pretty uh, cr bad and it seems to be pretty permanent. However, we're going to figure out a way of fixing this. I sense that Philip can't 
hear anything I'm saying. Maybe fantastic, you... fantastic, great to see Kiki. Okay, <laughs> there is there is a terrible delay, folks. I am so sorry about this. Um, what we will do, I'll tell you this right now. If we don't get the internet to behave itself this evening, we're going to reschedule this so that you get to hear the important message that Philip and Compassion and Wealth Farming have because this is too important to um, to miss. And it's also, um, as much as it's lovely to see Kiki, that's not the reason you're all here. So we will we will rectify this one way or another, whether it's tonight or another night. But I get the impression the video looks a little better right now as far as I'm seeing Philip. You are nodding as well, which is good. We might just be on, look at this. Look at this. It's like it's 2020 or something. <laughs> yeah. Are we, are we a bit more in sync? We're 100% in sync right now. It's, it seems to be having these strange waves of, 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 of not cooperating with us at all, but now it's cooperating great. So you, uh, we, we got you loud and clear with what you said about the, the um, increase in, in meat eating and the fact that there's billions, literally, so I think you said 75 billion farmed animals and countless fish. How can we ignore... The, the conditions in which they're kept, how can we ignore the welfare of those animals when that industry is, whether we like it or not, a reality? Absolutely. And that's our mission is to to save those animals from suffering and uh, you know, you know, to stop it from happening. Yeah. Uh, full stop. And we work with we work with governments. We work with companies. We work with the, the United Nations. We work with people. Uh, of all ages and uh, of all backgrounds to save animals from suffering uh, is what it's all about. And uh, one of the things that we've been doing over the last uh, 18 months is we've been running a coalition campaign. We've got 170 other groups together to end the cage age, a European citizens initiative that some of you will and I know have taken part in, which is a, a, uh, a an official uh, petition. And of course, being an official petition that the European Commission has put together, you have to get a million signatures within 12 months. You have to achieve certain parameters and they make it as hard as possible for you to do that. So we got 170 organizations together. We gave them all the website tools to go out and marshal their supporters in all the different countries across Europe. And we got more than a million signatures, one and a half million signatures. It's been one of the most successful official petitions in uh, in the in European history. And uh, today, we actually had two of, of the European commissioners with us at a webinar with the legendary Dr. Jane Goodall, uh, the wow. legendary conservationist, uh, chimpanzee expert and, uh, and UN uh, messenger of peace. All And what we were talking about was a future without cages, the need for us to move beyond factory farming for all our sakes. Because you know, one of the things which is quite topical, what quite relevant right now, Dan, is that the 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 current pandemic pan pandemic covid-19 um is thought most likely to have emanated from a chinese wet market from the illegal consumption of wildlife well the next pandemic could well be on our plate it could come from factory farms and it wouldn't be the first time either would it i mean that's the crazy thing about this is that w who needs convincing of that when you consider the fact that we've had in my lifetime albeit a reasonably long one now, um, we've had swine flu, mad cow disease, bird flu. So it, it, it's not, it, it sounds, people, I, I, I find it fascinating and terrifying in equal measure that people still seem to find it a, the stuff of fantasy, some, some potential dystopian future that probably won't happen. It has happened and it's happening right now. And so's the delay again. The delay's back. Absolutely. The uh, the last pandemic uh, was in two. Uh, no, you, you the delay's on. back. Uh, our old friend. The the uh, swine flu pandemic, Dan, was in two thousand and nine, and it's worth remembering that 
the swine flu started from farm animals. Of course, it started from factory farms uh, in the Americas. Uh, it's believed the ground zero is believed to be a little uh, a little town called La Gloria up in the mountain plateaus of Mexico. And I've been there and I've spoken to the to the locals, heard how it devastated their lives, their community, and their community. This small dusty town uh, is neighboring them are, are a million pigs being produced a year, a million pigs out on the, the, the desert mountain plateau. And what's really interesting, I was there for several days and I visited those pig farms from the outside. They wouldn't let me in. Uh, and in those days, I never saw a pig. I smelt the absolute acrid uh, throat stinging smell that comes from a million pigs kept in uh, in in you know essentially in in a, a small geographical location uh, and i saw many of what looked like military installations you know a warehouse looking things with uh, tin grain silos for for feed that's where swine flu came from uh, at least that's that's the theory uh, and the the uh, uh, yeah, I think that the, the key thing to for us to remember is that keeping animals caged, cramped, and confined provides the breeding ground, the perfect breeding ground for disease, for novel and more dangerous viruses. Swine flu was was one of them. It killed up to half a million people worldwide. Uh, that, uh, together with runaway meat consumption, uh, is another big thing. Half the planet half the habitable land surface of the planet is used to, to grow our food. Of that, more than 80% is dedicated to meat and dairy production, more than 80%. And so as we continue to increase meat and dairy consumption, which is what's happening worldwide, we continue to converge into the remaining wild lands, wildlife habitats, tropical rainforests and the like. And what that does is not only wipes away whole ecosystems, it shakes free the viruses into what they call spillover events, brings us people into contact with those novel viruses, which essentially is setting up the stage for future pandemics and and again uh, you know it's it sounds like something out of a horror movie far into the future but we're we're literally living and breathing this right now one of those spillover events you've just referred to is exactly what's caused what we're experiencing now isn't it <laughs> so the delay has become i see movement i see movement i do apologize for this folks i think that as you can see it's coming coming in way i think i missed that last part tell me the question the um well it was just to re really to reiterate the the uh, the point you made that again you know once again what you're describing which sounds like something out of a futuristic horror film is what we're living and experiencing right now today because of exactly the kind of circumstances you, you just spoke of. Um, now, Philip, something I wanted to it ask. It is, and, but the great thing is that people... Please, carry on, carry on. Well, I was going to say, Dan, that uh, the great thing is that people are starting to join the dots. People are starting to see that our treatment of animals is actually rebounding on people, on our society. And if COVID-19 has shown us anything, you know, I don't see it as, as a warning. I see it as a demonstration of the very fragility of our society, that everything that we hold dear could be snatched away overnight and has done. Uh, and that what we need to do is, is to take stock uh, and have a reset we need a reset of the way that we view and we treat animals in society, in our in our food and farming system as a, a big 
big example. And I think people are, are, are more and more willing to, to take on board those big messages that actually big change needs to happen. So what does that big change need, uh, need to look like? Well, as I was saying to the European Commissioner uh, and to the European parliamentarians today, it needs to look like UK and Europe taking a leadership role, that, that we need to see an end to the cage age. Let's get rid of these cages and crates. They belong in the dark ages. They should be in the history books. 300 million animals here and now are living um, a, a life, an existence, a terrible, um, t a terrible existence in these cages. Let's get rid of those. What we need to do is to set challenging targets to reduce meat and dairy. You know, let's not just leave it to consumers. We need leadership from governments, from companies, from the United Nations to set a new policy framework. And what we are doing as an organization, as well as, um, you know, as, well as talking with individual companies, individual politicians, individual people, is we're also calling for a global action plan, a global agreement akin to that Paris Agreement on Climate Change to end factory farming to reset, to, in the words of the UN, build back better without factory farming and with a much reduced reliance on meat and dairy in our diets. Now, you've, you've made some, some references to the literally billions of animals that are subjected to this and also millions in the case of the pig, uh, the pig farm that you, you uh, experienced firsthand. And actually, we've just had a you know, a couple of comments uh, coming in to talk about the, the similar experience they've had where where they, you know, as you described it as burning your eyes. And in fact, I'll share the comment from Helen there. You can, you know, you can barely breathe because of it. And now there's a pigeon coming into my house. Come on. Yeah. You can't come in. It's Kiki's house. Um, so, sorry, there literally was a wood pigeon coming into my living room then. Um, Philip, what I wanted to ask you about is the fact that you you spoke to us about uh, about this in the uh, when we were filming food for thought you spoke about something that shocked me to my core and i had no knowledge of before but i know that you're very very well versed on this and that what what you've described so far plays a huge part can you tell us a little bit about the impact all of this factory farming is having on soil and soil degradation as a specific issue Absolutely. Well, essentially what factory farming has done has broken a 10,000 year contract between humanity and the land. 10,000 years ago, we started farming. We decided to, as a species, to no longer be nomads and instead to settle on the land, uh, to, to start farming. And it, as we did so, we signed a contract with the soil because that's where more than 95% of our food comes from. Well, in the last lifetime really in the last 70 years we've been tearing up that contract um, we've taken farm animals off of the land put them into factory farms uh, and uh, that which looks like a space saving idea but actually isn't because you then have to use vast acreages of land elsewhere to grow their food usually industrially using chemical fertilizers and pesticides and what this has done has brought a ruination of the soil uh, and if we continue as we are, then the United Nations warns us that we have just 60 harvests left, just 60 years left before our soils are either depleted or gone. I mean, that that is exactly the, the statistic and the, the fact that you, you shared with us when we were filming, which which shocked me so much to to understand that, to put that in perspective, we're literally saying that the soil would have, after 60 more harvests or 60 years, 60 cycles, will no longer have the ability to produce anything. It will not have any nutrients left or any, any uh, viable crop 
that, that, that can grow from it. And again, while we're waiting, <laughs> the strangest broadcast, but but it's uh, it's a broadcast no less. There she goes. So uh, I do while I, I I'm I. I'm hesitant to even speak again because I know that Philip will be hearing what I was saying <laughs> and he's going to, he's just seeing Kiki, but I have to just cut in and say this again. For anyone who's joining us late, I do apologize for this. We're, we're experiencing some real uh, problems with the interwebs this evening and uh, it's it's not cooperating in the slightest. So um, apologies. I will edit it out for the YouTube video that we'll subsequently share. And as you can see, Philip is now hearing what I was saying a good minute ago <laughs> this is going to be quite the editing job I'm going to have to fill this gap. I really don't know how long this is going to be, guys. I, I'm so sorry. Um, what we'll do is we'll continue. See, I'm, as I say, I'm very reluctant to fill the gaps because I know that when Philip eventually catches up, me filling the gaps will just flat out interrupt him when he finally starts uh, hearing me and talking in response. Um, however, what I will do with this, with this, I think uh, I've got cut, you. I think I've got you, Dan. Oh, really? Right now. Yeah, no, you don't. <laughs> you got me a minute yeah. ago. This is this is like time well, travel. Yeah, well, uh, the delay is pretty short now. Yeah, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of fun watching the silence. <laughs> let's see how. Let's just have a staring competition. See what we can do. See the the, the trouble with this is that this is a serious topic. This is a really serious. I'm still subject. here. Oh, yeah, we see you. We see you. Um, <laughs> yeah, Philip, as Val says, let's get this up on screen because um, Philip's point that he's making is, is, is not just yeah. fascinating and interesting. It's also crucially important. So, you know, it's something that we all need to understand. As I said at the very beginning when we first started this, this broadcast this evening, you know, if we, everyone can see it when it comes to cars, for example, no one's no one's going to say until there's a hundred percent electric cars on the road. Who cares what the, the the petrol driven and diesel driven cars do? How much they pollute? What the emissions are? Or the companies behind them not being held accountable and responsible for the things that they're manufacturing, for the for the fumes that their their products are belching out into the atmosphere? We have to hold those organisations accountable and. As I said, you know, if we're going to do that for a vehicle and for air pollution, we have to absolutely do it for a sentient being. And as we all know now, even more significant air pollution, which is caused by factory farming, more significant than the entire transportation sector combined. So it's a staggering, staggering statistic. Um, I can tell from the way Philip's sitting very quietly listening to me and he nodding in the wrong moments. I think we've still got a latent delay or no maybe we are you back <laughs> you are back i think i think yeah, i'm not far about i'm not far behind yeah you're right you're right with me that's amazing yeah bowl Good. me a question i will i'll I tell you in a minute or two tell us a bit because because everything the, the wonderful news philip is that everything you're saying we're hearing it's just that the video is freezing yeah I mean, and then the delay is coming in so i'm going to lo load you up with a question and let you go and please feel free to talk for as long as you like i would like you to tell us about your book because i know you've got a book now called farmageddon and uh, i've actually seen a couple of comments about it including one from someone saying that they went vegetarian because of that book can you tell us a little bit about that book and how it, what it's what it's about and how it came to be
Well, Farmageddon, the true cost of cheap meat is is a global journey, uh, expose, if you like, of factory farming, of what we do to farm animals in the pursuit of cheap meat and dairy. And I wrote that book with a journalist uh, at the time, the political editor of the Sunday Times called Isabel Oakshot. And, and you know, we went around the world. And one of the places that, that we went to as a sort of real, uh, a real example of what factory farming could look like was California. We went to a place called Central Valley, which is the land of milk and honey in that part of America. And I remember being with, with Isabel in this vast, vast landscape of monocultures, of single crops. And we were in the almond groves where most of the world's almonds are produced. And they're, they're in these rows that go on for miles. And as, I, as, we, as we stood amongst the almond groves, I said to Isabel, listen, just listen. And you know what we heard? Nothing. Not the chirp of a bird or the buzz of a bee, because they'd gone. What we did hear was uh, the, the low thud of a helicopter in the distance spraying, pesticide spraying nature into oblivion. And it was all part of a daily chemical assault from aircraft, from land craft, from people in protective suits. And we decided to take to the air to look at this uh, this scene and we're in this small plane and we looked at this patchwork quilt of 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 vast monocultures and in between some of them there was what looked like a vicious scar on the landscape and each one of those scars was a mega dairy a dairy with 12,000 cows standing in a single muddy paddock, not a blade of grass in sight. And I said to Isabel, Isabel, this is what people see as the future. This is what people see as the way that farming should go. And Isabel looked at me and she said, you know, Philip, this doesn't look like a future. This looks more like Farmageddon. And so the the title of the book was born uh we we toured america we toured europe we went to china uh to south africa looking at factory farms looking at the realities in the way that animals are caged crammed and confined and also looking for solutions because you know there are things that we can do and the idea behind the book really was to reach a new audience to reach the waterstones audience if you like the wh smith audience we wanted people to ha to be able to lift from the shelves a book about factory farming that could empower them to take up the fight to try to stop what's going on because we can all we can all help uh, change things through our, our food consumption patterns we've talked about this earlier about eating plants eating more plants uh, and if, if if people are eating meat and dairy then less and better from pasture fed free range or organic sources non-organic uh, sorry non-factory farmed in other words mm -hmm. um but the other things that we could do is join the campaign, join the movement to end factory farming. And that's what Compassion in World Farming is. We're a movement. We're a movement that was founded by a dairy farmer more than 50 years ago called Peter Roberts. And, and, now, and, and what Peter did was he gave up dairy farming because he saw what was happening to the animals. He and his family went vegetarian and he was one of the first plant based innovators. What he was doing was he started a company called Direct Foods that was all about producing meat like uh, soya chunks, if you like. This was way back in the 70s uh, when these things were almost unheard of and selling them to people. So he was one of the real pioneers. And as he got the word out, as he got traction, then he started to see success. He started to see some of the first uh, bans coming into place on some of the worst systems and practices. So whilst we move the whole planet, the whole of humanity to this compassionate world world that we that we that Dan you and I and uh, I'm sure uh, everyone watching wants to see whilst we do that we inch forward to this world where 
farm animals are taken out of the system. Whilst we do that, our mission is also to stop the suffering, to relieve their suffering, uh, which of course goes on every second of every minute, of every hour, of every day, of every week, of every month of their life. It's unrelenting. And that is why our work is unrelenting. And we started off in the UK, then we went into Europe. Now we're in China, America, uh, into Africa. We are going to make sure that this is a global movement, an unrelenting global movement to stop animal suffering to end factory farming and see that by 2100 at the latest, meat eating as we know it, is, it will be a thing of the past. Well, um, I was going to be grateful when the internet corrected itself, but the fact that it corrected itself for you to speak so beautifully about that and as passionately and powerfully as you just did is an absolute gift and I'm very, very grateful to you and to the internet gremlins and angels because that went beautifully. And thank you for those incredibly powerful words. Um, it's something that that strikes me. You know, when you talk, I hear you talk about the suffering and the cruelty. Um, and, and this is echoed by a number of comments that have come through this evening already. And something that we've talked about on previous broadcasts as well. Um, with with all of the horrors that you see with all of the brutality that you've you you know i i talk about this a lot in in this you know in this animal conservation animal welfare movement of ours if you want to address the problems you need to immerse yourself in them to understand them you need to know your enemy and that can be incredibly painful i know that a lot of people watching will know this because they've experienced it firsthand i know i have i've gone through long periods of abject i guess depression and and just sorrow at a, to a level that burns and i know that that for, for many of us that is the fuel that's the fire that burns inside of us that makes us try that much harder and keep fighting the fight but what's your mechanism how do you deal with all of the i've seen questions asking about the length of time it takes to achieve these these things i've seen questions about the just the sheer brutality that you have to witness how do you deal with these things as because you've got this you're a wonderful human being you've got a beautiful energy about you and you talk with such conviction and compassion and power where do you find that how do you do that with everything that you have to see well i think that uh I take energy from the natural world. You know, I'm out in the countryside uh, every day, uh, drawing that energy in, wondering at, you know, just a great wonder around me. But also, you know, when I look into the eyes of, of uh, our dog, our rescue dog, Duke, that he brings me tremendous motivation. When I look at our hens, we have four rescue hens here in the garden. That brings me tremendous motivation. It's about looking in, into the eyes. You know, Dan, you're a photographer. Uh, and I've recently taken up photography. And, and I was doing a photography lecture only a week ago. And I was trying to say to people that one of the things that I look to do is is not only to capture the the form of animals, of wildlife, of, of farm animals, but their personality. And I think it's looking into the eyes of animals and seeing that personality. That's what gives me energy. That's what gives me the get up and go to keep going. Because, you know, the thing, Dan, you and the, the listener, you know, people that are watching us today, you know, I, I, I'm sure are, are sensitive people. And the thing about, you know, sensitive people is we connect with other beings. One of the one of the great um, tragedies, though, is that as sentient, as, as sen uh, you know, sensitive people, we put ourselves through those traumas of seeing awful cruelties. But I do that. I do that to bear witness. I do that so that I can tell people with no uncertainty what goes on and why it has to stop. And there's, again, as always is, uh, is the case in these, uh, these wonderful moments where you're sharing so directly from the heart 
it's inspiring people and it's uh, impassioning people. And, and, and one that I want to draw your attention to is on the screen right now from Andy Moore, who very kindly says, Philip, I'm on furlough all of June. I have a laptop and a phone. What can I do to help CIWF? I well, love that question. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and thank you, Andy, for asking it. But Philip, what, what sort of thing can Andy do? Or maybe you I'd, need to have a conversation offline, but what, how can people generally help? Firstly, you know, sign up to the campaign. Uh, you know, uh, log on to ciwf.org and subscribe to our e email newsletters. We'll send you uh, the latest news, the latest info, how you can get involved in the campaigns. Um, Andy would love to for, for you to talk with the team. Uh, you know, perhaps setting up a Facebook page or getting the word out. Perhaps a local group. There may be a local compassion group near you that you could get involved in. Uh, you know, there's not many physical events going on at the moment it's all online of course but you know one fine day when this covid cloud lifts it will be great uh for you and i and other compassionate people andy dan for us to meet on the battlefront so you know get in touch andy uh write us a note um sign up to to uh to, to our website campaigns and we will keep you stoked with the latest actions against the live export trade against the cage age against factory farming against the runaway meat and dairy industry for a better world for animals people and the planet which almost sounds like the perfect end but i'm not we're not done we're not done because the for two reasons one is i know just how much philip has to share that is incredibly valuable to us all, but also because the internet's behaving. Why would we end now? Although you could say, let's end on a, on a high, but, <laughs> but, let, but let's not. Because you, you've said something a couple of times today. You've said, you've just talked very eloquently again, as always, about the whole planet, the whole of humanity. And you did so some time ago when you talked about the benefits of what we're referring to here. You've also, as just like the soil degradation statistics that you that you shared with us and just like the, the some of the other facts and and the information and knowledge that you share you you've also shared with me in the past the the f the food system that we currently run and operate if if corrected if shifted if changed would solve world poverty world famine starvation can you talk a little bit about that Absolutely. I mean, people say that we need factory farming to feed the world. Well, actually, the opposite is true, because what you do with, fa with factory farming is you take farm animals off of grass, off of pasture, where essentially animals make their own living. You put them into factory farms, which, as I said earlier, was you know, it looks like a space saving idea, but isn't because then vast acreages have to be dedicated to growing their feed. What is that feed? Cereals, soya, essentially food which people people could eat on arable land that could be growing food for people. How big is that arable land growing food for factory farms? Well, if it was a single field, it would cover the entire land surface of the European Union. And if all of that grain were fed, instead of feeding it to factory farms, you fed it to people, it would feed an extra 4 billion people on the planet. Now, that's not to say that 4 billion extra people on the planet is a good idea. Uh, it wouldn't be, not all at once. It would be an environmental disaster. It's actually to say that factory farming, instead of producing food, wastes food. It wastes enough food to feed half, more than half of the entire human population of planet earth today so you know it's a no-brainer stop being cruel to animals stop feeding all of that food to factory farms stop cutting down the rainforests to make way for more of this soya uh, for fa for factory farms um, stop emitting all of those greenhouse gases the meat and livestock sector, which is driven by factory farming, produces more greenhouse gases than all of the planes, trains and cars put together. So, you know, if I, if Dan, if you and I were, were king for a day, what we could do is we could set about, you know, in the next half an hour, a, a massive policy program of writing the major challenges facing humanity today. 
because they they converge with our food system they converge with the wrongs that we meet out to animals so there's a beautiful sweet spot here a win-win so let's be compassionate to animals let's reduce the numbers in the system drastically and quickly for all our sakes Let's give ourselves the ability to feed the world. Let's give ourselves the ability to let nature breathe again, because one of the biggest drivers of, of environmental decline is factory farming. And what allowing nature to breathe again will do is that it will allow us to continue to have the things which really matter in life, the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, and the food we eat. Take the animals out of factory farms and let nature continue that fantastic job of looking after you, me, and every other living creature. Uh, again, how beautifully put. And because you mentioned beautiful living creatures. <laughs> <laughs> She's fantastic. And this time, just you love. Because of the, now this time there's no delay. Just, so he gets to see it. Just love. Beautiful timing because you, you literally just said every other living creature, and it's a, it's an interesting thing. Um, well, interesting is such an understatement. Listening to you talk so eloquently and passionately about all these things is is a is a real privilege. It's a real gift, um, and I think that you know what what's clear is that we we have to be very very grateful for the fact that there's a person like you at the forefront of an organisation who are at the forefront themselves of this this movement towards a more compassionate world and dealing with some things that most of us would really rather not have to face um and 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 taking on some challenges which as we've seen from some of the comments have been sometimes decades long challenges and ongoing not even resolved yet but of course what strikes me as i'm listening to you talk and as i'm thinking to myself as i'm constantly trying to think to myself how will how do we maximize the, 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 the positive impact this can have on people listening? Maybe a year from now, when someone, after I've done the edit on the, on the delay, and, <laughs> and, and when, they've, when they've sat and watched it, and, they, and they, maybe they're taking all this in and thinking, wow, God, that's incredible, these, in, these, these amazing objectives and these campaigns. And, but guess what? Every single individual right now has the ability to do something that you, Philip, put very, very succinctly at the very beginning. Three times a day, you get to have an absolute, immediate, and positive impact on everything we're talking about just by choosing not to eat meat. Simple as that. Exactly. Isn't it? it is. Game changing decisions are made at dinner time. Not just at dinner time, but also tea and breakfast, too. So you choose wisely what you're putting on your plate. Choose compassionately, kindly. Uh, you know, one of the one of the things which gives me great hope, actually, Dan, is the rise in plant based foods, in plant based meats. So cool. that people, you know, I, many years ago, I was a, a meat eater and I loved meat. I didn't give up meat because I didn't like it. I gave up meat because I felt it was the right thing to do. But, you know, being able to have a plant based burger that tastes like meat, you know, what a joy. I and mean, it's a strange thing to say. But more than that, Dan, you know, there's more in that not only are these things getting better and more meat like, but there's also stem cell meat, cellular agriculture. So meat that can be produced without animals, without slaughter, real meat, but from stem cells in a ferment, in a fermenter, if you like. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with fermentation. Uh, after all, we, we are so many of us, I'm a wine drinker, but my, so many of us like a pint of beer. That comes from a fermenter. So why not have slaughter-free meat in the future from a fermentation tank? And you know, one of the great things, Dan, is that when, when, the, when the production levels of this cellular agriculture takes off and the prices plummet, that new technology will cut the legs off of factory farming because factory farming you know produces 
cheap meat, cheap anonymous meat for people, you know, who are buying, uh, you know, bargain burgers in the freezer that, you know, is labeled poorly or not at all, you know, very, you know in terms of clarity anyway. Uh, and it is that, it is th that where that factory farm meat is going, that is the market that will be filled once cellular agriculture takes off. Factory farming will collapse almost overnight. That's my prediction. So that is why I think there's reasons to be hopeful, to be very hopeful that in the coming decades, as the imperative to change speeds up, that we will see a societal move away from factory farming, move away from meat eating as we know it, to these more slaughter-free forms, plant-based forms that mimic meat so, so, so uh, wonderfully. But, you know, coming back to the to the point we all have the power we have the power in our fingertips to take part in internet campaigns join the movement to end factory farming stop the suffering join compassion in world farming and take that big decision three times a day what you put on your plate so beautifully put always every single time and i thank you from the bottom of my heart for that now before we um before we wrap up and say goodbye to Philip, uh, I want to let you know about my next guest, who I'm so proud and excited to introduce you to on, let me check my calendar, because <laughs> I need to, Friday, Friday at 7 p.m. I'm going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to say a sentence to you, which I think you'll, you'll, you'll appreciate. Man and nature together is sustainable. Man and nature together is sustainable. And this is so relevant to what we've been talking about tonight. Well, man and nature together is sustainable, spells the acronym Mantis. And Mantis Collection is an incredible, uh, global, very global hotel chain um, owned and created over the, over the years by uh, Adrian Gardner and his son, Paul Gardner. Um, to put some perspective around this, Adrian Gardner is the man responsible for creating the Shamwari Game Reserve, as we heard about from, um, from Will Travers and Virginia McKenna on Saturday more recently, um, who, who also donated the land in the Shamwari Game Reserve to the Born Free Foundation, which has become the Born Free Big Cat Sanctuary. Paul Gardner, his son, is the CEO of Mantis Collection, the, the Mantis Group. And this is a chain of hotels all over the world. And the organization, the, the hotel group, sees it as their responsibility to fly the flag, if you will, for sustainability in the tourism sector. Now, think about the impact of this in the world that we're now in, the, the, the moment that we're in where suddenly everything's about to be unlocked. Everyone's about to, if they've got the money, of course, assuming they've still got an income, they've got the money to travel. And you can bet, just like we saw people flooding down to the beaches and the parks and the, the, the nature reserves that usually are tranquil and, and have trashed them, leaving litter in their wake. And, and, and we, you know, we could be looking at a global version of that any day soon. Mantis sees it as their responsibility to create not just hotels, but experiences where man and nature can coexist, where sustainability, ecotourism is the focus. It's not just, it's not, it's not just a part of what they do. It's the, it's the priority to what they do. They have got such an incredible reach in conservation, which I want to talk to you about on Friday at seven o'clock with Paul Gardner, the CEO of Mantis. So please join us then. It will be an incredible interview with an incredible man running an incredible organization. When, when you hear the extent to which these people reach into conservation and play a part and are, and are driving a driving force and leading the way in conservation this is no ordinary hotel chain so please join me at seven o'clock on friday to talk to mr paul gardner and it will be such a pleasure to introduce you to him then uh, between now and then i'll also in fact perhaps then i will tell you who my guest will be on uh, a slightly altered time slot of 5 p.m on sunday I can't wait to tell you who that will be because um, I think most of you will know him and he's a wonderful, wonderful human being. But I'm going to save that because I don't want to um, I don't want to give all the cards away just yet. Um, so uh, 
seven o'clock Friday, Paul Gardner from Mantis. Mr. Philip Limbury, you always speak with 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 such a incredible eloquence and and passion and the and the knowledge that you have, the expertise, the, the you 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 live and breathe this cause, which is not easy, you know, as as we've discussed a little bit tonight. And and it really does. I mean, it takes some getting involved in, and you've been involved in it for a lifetime. And for the fact that you're spearheading this this kind of effort, and you're you're leading the way and giving us all an incredibly compassionate example to follow, I am eternally grateful. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much for having me along. Thank you for bringing an inspiration. Thank you, sir. Thank you, my friend. It's such a pleasure, and we will see you soon for uh, uh, that face-to-face -face catch up when we're allowed. I, I can't wait for that. Um, I'm so grateful to you for coming and sharing this uh, this with us this evening. It's been an absolute pleasure. Again, uh, thank you so much for enduring the uh, the internet issues that we that we had and and for sticking with it. I really appreciate you because I know your time is valuable, um, and and it really means a lot to us that you that you gave us this time, uh, especially with the challenges. Uh, that we faced and uh it's been absolutely fascinating and inspiring and and as always empowering it's just amazing to listen to you talk so thank you so much for taking the time and joining us and um we'll look forward to seeing you very soon an absolute pleasure and, go and well thank I, you when i cut the live broadcast on on the world you and i can say a, another goodbye so don't go away but you guys I, you know, I can't thank you enough for sticking with us this evening. As I know it was challenging, as I said, when I do, when I do put it out onto YouTube, I will. Well, it's actually already on YouTube, so you can enjoy the the, the moments of Philip and I just staring into space, <laughs> waiting for the other one to talk. <laughs> Please enjoy. Feel free to enjoy, but I will do an edited version as well. Perhaps we'll just leave this one up for posterity's sake. Um, but I'll do an edited version too. So, you know, if you want to share this incredibly important message that Philip has shared with your friends, family, anyone who you feel would benefit, which of course is everyone, then uh, watch this space um, for an edited version as well. But thank you all so much for joining us as always. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for your in engagement, your interaction, your comments. Um, spread the love. It's a, it's, a, it's a funny old world out there right now. And there's a lot of darkness happening, but uh, as the, the great... Uh, Martin Luther King said, um, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. And hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. And I think his words, always so poignant, have never been more poignant than, than they are right now in this world. And uh, I think as, as just as one final word, Philip, you again are the embodiment of that. So thank you for shining your light into the world. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. We'll see you soon. It's a, it's a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Good night.